on uh, YouTube. Sure. Somehow, uh, through some sort of problems with acid transactions, I think Zoom lost all my uh, all my streaming setup. But it looks good for those of you out there in YouTube land. And there's exactly zero of you right now. Uh, we're streaming the ClickHouse August vir uh, virtual meetup. This is from the SF Bay Area uh, ClickHouse meetup. Uh, we'll be getting started in just a few minutes, so hang in there, and uh, we'll be right back. Feel free, by the way, to sign in um, and say hi in the comments. Okay, so we got streaming. That is good. Oh, and we have, looks like we already have four viewers. So, um, let's see. So, uh, I think, Ankit, you're going to be doing the, the, the presentation or a, I could look in the, uh, it's a, uh, I'm kid. Uh, do you want to go ahead and try, uh, uh, try sharing your screen to make sure you're able to do a share? Sure. Let me check that. And I mean, I can guess. you, conf yeah. Can you confirm you can hear me? Okay. As well. Yes. You can. Good. Uh, All right. Great. I can hear you perfectly. You cannot start a screen share while the other participant is oh, sharing. You know, I'm an idiot. I do this. I, I do this like <laughs> for hours a day. Yes, exactly. Go ahead and try sharing now. Looks totally awesome. Cool. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and uh, yeah, pull this down. And let's. Uh, this should pop up on the uh, on YouTube. Uh, video as well. Yep. Uh, I see you guys. Cool. All right. I'm going to go ahead and kill your share because uh, you should be, and are you going to be presenting just off, um, looks like you're using Google Docs. Um, Ankit, you want to do a full screen? We are presenting. Yeah. Both. Go to, yeah. yeah. Looks great. Why don't you go ahead and stop the share because I'm going to continue to sh uh, go ahead and reshare the, the thing for the uh, uh, the main window, and then we can. Sure. All right, there we go. Good, great. We're just waiting for uh, one more of our pals to show up. That is um, Alexander Sopin, and then I think we can get going. Um, well, we'll give the attendees uh, time to to show up as well. So um, for those of you that are out there, since while we're waiting, if you want to just go ahead and say hi, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just go ahead and raise your hand if you want to uh, say hi. Otherwise, just post hi in the chat. Um, you should be able to do that through the control panel. I'm going to try to avoid unmuting everybody randomly because uh, we could have a pretty big crowd here. I think these are both interesting topics that we're covering today. Yeah, and tell us where you're from. That's uh, uh, that's cool. And if you're doing something interesting with ClickHouse, feel free to uh, uh, feel free to chip in and and you can even take a minute and talk about it while we're waiting. Guys, I'm going to go ahead and um, mute for a second. I need to post the links out on uh, on Telegram and Slack to let people know we're live.
Okay, we're, uh, I've just posted the links on Telegraph or, or Telegram. I'm going to go ahead and post them on Slack and then I think we can get going. Because I don't see Alexander Sopin. Let me make sure that he's able to get in. Okay, just pinged him and one more housekeeping thing and then we can get started. Okay, good. All right, so looks like Alexander is on the way in. I think we can get going. So um, welcome everybody. I think we'll have a lot more attendees. We had well over a hundred signups. And of course, uh, there's a number of people uh, joining us from YouTube. We're currently have about 16 people live. We've got 11 people on YouTube and we expect to see uh, uh, see coming uh, more people coming in. So for those of you on YouTube, hello, I can see your comments. Welcome. It's great to have you here. Oh, and uh, great. We've got our final speaker. Let's talk a little bit about today's meetup. So this is our August meetup. Um, for those of you who've not attended before, this is a ClickHouse community event. We try and get the most interesting and coolest things that people are doing on ClickHouse every couple months or so and share them with you. We have a couple of treasures uh, today. So we've been watching the Cygnos project for a number of, of uh, for actually quite some time. And Pranay and Ankit are here today to talk about how that works. They'll be uh, talking about building observability with ClickHouse's storage. Uh, and we love to have anything that shows ClickHouse uh, being used underneath an app. So welcome Ankit and um, we're looking forward to you talk. Following that talk, we're going to have another one from uh, Sasha Sopin or Alexander Sopin, as as you may see his uh, see his name. He is working on the project to replace Zookeeper with an internal implementation, and this is in probably the biggest operational change in ClickHouse in years. Uh, Alexander is going to make it work perfectly, so no pressure. This, by the way, is the first time anybody has talked about this in English or Russian, according to Alexander. So that'll that'll be the follow on talk. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. So we've got people on um, both, you know, listening in through Zoom. If you want to talk, this is we try to keep this kind of interactive. Uh, you know, if you want to talk, we can definitely unmute you and, and allow conversations. Um, and and so we'll try and keep it uh, informal. We will try to proceed fairly briskly so that we get both talks in at a reasonable period of time and allow for um, uh, time to do a question and answer session on ClickHouse in general at the end. That's, a, that's kind of a tradition. Let's see, one other, uh, two other things. If you'd like to do a talk at a future uh, meetup, feel free to either email me through the platform. You can also send mail to info at alternity.com. We love anything related to ClickHouse and we, and we wanna hear it. There is one final thing, which is kind of a preview. We mentioned this at the last meetup, but Alternity is going to be sponsoring a conference. It's called OSACon 2021. It's gonna be on November 2nd. And it is a conference devoted to open source analytics. So we're going to have talks from people doing interesting projects across the entire open source community, anything related to analytics. We already have uh, people like Peter Zaitsev um, from Percona, great open source person, uh, Maxime Beauchemin from, um, uh, from Preset. He's the author of both Superset as well as Airflow, uh, will be, uh, is planning to present. 
we'll have more details on this um, as uh, shortly. You can you'll see an announcement next week. And one of the things we'd really like to do is get solid presentations, really interesting presentations on applications that use ClickHouse in addition to the cool technology that's going on in the open source projects. I think with that, I'm going to stop talking um, and go ahead and turn this over to Ankit. So Ankit, I'm going to kill my share. And why don't you go ahead and take over? Thank you very much, Robert, for hosting this session and letting us the opportunity to talk about how we are using ClickHouse to build an observability platform. Hey, folks, I am Ankit. Uh, I'm from Signals. Uh, before we start, I would like to talk a brief about myself. Like, um, I have been into eight years into technology and building um, scalable technology architecture, working from AIML distributed systems to trading in cryptocurrencies and all. So before Signals, I was handling a team of a few uh, 10, 12 people in who were into microservices architecture and they were facing the problem of debugging systems and all. I'm passionate in general about distributed tracing systems and how they can be used to handle scale and storage. Right now, I am passionate about building Signals, which is also a part of Y Combinator. Uh, we were into winter 21 batch of Y Combinator. And when I'm not working, I love trekking and I love Himalayas. If you have heard about it, I often go to trek there and roughly I have done around eight to 10 treks there. So to start out Signals, so Signals, at Signals, they're building an open source observability platform. So for those folks for whom observability is still a new term, I would like to break it down into three pillars. One is metrics, other is traces, and the third is logs. With locks, we are very much familiar because it has been there for a long time. We have been using Elasticsearch, ELK stack, and now Loki is a player from Grafana that is doing in that domain. We have a fair amount of idea about metrics. Also, we like to monitor infrastructure and a few applications. Like we like to monitor red metrics, like how is the RPS coming to our application? How are the error rates going? How much time actually is my application taking? And all those things. So Prometheus has been a very important and major tool in this domain that is doing fantastic in the community. And something about distributed tracing that is a new pillar into this observability platform. So distributed tracing is when you trace a request from through the different layers of software or applications in your infrastructure. So when the, the request hits a load balancer, two goes to service app one, so it goes to service two, then it go across service three, and finally it calls the database and returns the call from the database to the user. So we try to track down the request through all of these steps and try to find out if there is an anomaly and we try to debug the system doing a root cause analysis. Right. So this is the brief about the three pillars of observability. Now, so at Signals, we are trying to be a single pane of glass for these, the three pillars, metrics, traces, and locks. Till today, we have to use different set of tools uh, for doing each of these pillars. Like I said, Prometheus for metrics, Jagger for distributed tracing. Jagger is, by the way, an open source project from Uber. And for locks, we have been using Elasticsearch. So maintaining all of these three different tools, managing the UIs and the different features that each of them can give you, takes time to set up and build it up, right? And even to maintain these open source solutions. So to record, to remove the, all the, we try to remove all the dev effort that it takes to start using an open source solution and maintaining it. And we try to be as much out of the box as like possible as like other SaaS solutions like Datadog or New Relic or LightStep if you're aware of the domain. Right? So we try to be that, taking open source and giving the ease of use to the users. Now, when we talk about distributed tracing and logs, we have to run a lot of queries that needs to do a sort of aggregation over a few columns of fields. right? So like a simple example would be, you would like to know the P99 profile of a particular customer segment or region or set of instances that are deployed. Right? 
we need to do all sorts of sort of filtering and aggregation capabilities right and signals is able to provide all those uh, capabilities with the use of distributed column stores like clickhouse right more about it is that we are native to open telemetry like signals is a complete solution including backend and front end that fully complies with open telemetry for those of the folks who don't know much about open telemetry so open telemetry is a language agnostic and it's like a vendor neutral set of libraries that are given to that can be added to your individual applications so that they start sending telemetry data out of the box even more you can write your own a piece of events from your applications using the sdks that open telemetry provides so it's a vendor neutral open source project under cncf and signals at signals we try to position is at the default backend for your open telemetry frameworks and libraries you can just install signals into your cloud into your own infrastructure you don't need to send any data outside so for those who want to who have some sort of uh, PII issues or compliance issues and want to retain their data into their, into their own cloud, this can be a good solution because you do not need to send any of your data out. Okay. So with that, let me show you a quick demo, like how we do it uh, in Signos today, what sort of capabilities we enable and what sort of metrics and traces data we can expose. So as you install Signos, this is a landing dashboard that you will be receiving in your own uh, network right so these are the four services that are deployed automatically as a sample example called hot rod application that is also an open source sample application given by uber right so these are the four so front end service customer service driver service and route service and they talk to each other in some sort or the other way to give a response back to the user and this is a ride healing app something like uber does like you click on a button it calls service one, service two, service three, and gives a response back to the user, like a driver is arriving at your uh, place in this much amount of time, right? So when you land up with this dashboard in Signals, uh, you can see the P90 and latencies uh, of these applications. Also the errors these applications are throwing and the RPS, like how much request per second is your application receiving? When you try to drill down into any of these applications, you see different other set of metrics and data about that application. One panel, it would be like P15, 19, F5, and 99 percentile profiles of your latencies. Like how, uh, how are the 99 percent of the request performing? Right? You can see the general trend and how many RPS is your application handling, what's the error percentage, and what are the APIs, uh, the most important APIs that your application is taking into. Like, if how how is the API performing? Like what is up P15, 90, 95, and 99 percentiles, and what is the RPS? So this gives you some idea about how your application, a specific application, is performing. Right now, we are looking into the front-end application. When you click on the external calls, it gives you an idea like how this application is, is interacting with the external APIs. Like service one may be talking to service B, C, and D, and all external, even the external APIs, like it might be calling some payment gateways of PayPal and different sort of aggregation network that you have. So if service that your service might be failing because of some downstream services or dependent services, so you can get to know about them here. Like you can get the uh, error percentage that your application is throwing due to the external calls. How is the overall external call performing? If if you, any spike in the latency of your application is due to some dependent services or not, even by address, you can split up. Like how is it performing? Apart from that, if you're having any database calls from your application, like you're using SQL and MySQL services or MongoDB services, then you would get to know like if you're making and call to those databases, how are they performing? What is the RPS and how much average time are they taking up? It gives, you, it gives you an idea to debug latency issues in your application if the external calls and the database calls are taking time or not. Right. You can even drill down into more details into this graph. Let's say you got a spike uh, in, uh, in the latency profile in your application and you want to go and see like how, what exactly were the requests and how are they performing. You go and click view traces and you get all the trace data during that time period from that service. 
like all the individual events that were thrown and all that you can sort them by latencies like you want to see how uh, how many of the requests were taking more than a second and less than five seconds you get all the events that were there you might want to click and go into that detail and see what all events were emitted during that particular request so you can see high level diagram of that one and also the individual events like here we can see this event is taking most of the time of this event now you can drill down deeper into it and see finally a mysql query was executed which was taking 969 milliseconds now you know what things was going on and what time was it taking even you can see the mysql query which was taking more time and you can optimize on that Apart from that, since I was talking about the aggregation capabilities, let's say uh, you have an application and it is calling an external API or something, and you have a tag associated to that, like attribute, like HTTP.URL was taking, it's calling a, another service called customer service, which is hosted at port 8081. You can apply that filter and you can see the graph there. Like what is the uh, aggregate churn of uh, for, for all the events that were emitted due to these filters? Right. You can even see the duration of P99 profiles, P50 profiles, and all. Right. On top of that, you can see the high-level service diagram of how your services are interacting with each other. Like, what does the data flow look like? And when you hover over a service, you can see the request uh, RPS error rate and P99 latencies. Right. So this gives you a time. So if any of these services will be throwing errors, then you will see a red blob there. So this is the demo that I was trying to show. Oh, sorry. Let's stop this one. Now that we have seen a, a simple demo of how Signal's application works, we can go down deeper into what architecture actually enables it right so these are all the applications that generate the data these are hosted in your infrastructure and these are your applications you instrument them with open telemetry libraries and it starts sending data to signals packet this is the complete signals backend that can be hosted in your infrastructure hotel collector is a part of open telemetry project which can receive data and it can write to ClickHouse. <laughs> yeah. So we have written exporter over open telemetry collector that can write data to ClickHouse. Now ClickHouse has two tiers of storage, like hot and cold. Hot can store in the disk or the nodes, and the cold storage can write to S3. So this becomes very efficient when you talk in terms of optimization of data storage, right? S3 is cheap and you can store the past data that is not frequently used into S3. Now we have a query service that is written in Golang that is an interface between the database and the front end. The query service takes data from the ClickHouse and provides it to front end. The front end is written in React.js. So these are the different components that will that will you will see that it has installed in your infrastructure. One is Open Telemetry Collector, another is ClickHouse, one is Query Service written in GoLang, another is Frontend. Right. right. So before this, using ClickHouse, we're using we we are trying our hands with Kafka and Druid also. So the Hotel Collector used to write to Kafka, and from Kafka, Druid used to read the data, and the Query Service likewise used to read from the druid right but with a druid we had some issues like for a small team who wants to just start up using our open source tools it was taking a lot of resources like it was heavy in terms of usage of cpu and memory with clickhouse it it, it seems to be very light in terms of resources and it is very blazing fast right so we decided to go with clickhouse again Now we'll discuss why we chose ClickHouse for storing observability data.
the observability data has a lot of context around it like a lot of tags annotations key value pairs are associated with each and every event that gives a richness to the data so that you can query it for debugging and root cause analysis right so there can be a lot of columns in one particular row when you try to store it to a database right so eventually the table becomes wide enough and when you try to run aggregate queries on them it try to retrieve different columns uh, from different rows right and that is not efficient when you talk in terms of a row based storage right or database for those data where you need to retrieve only few columns and you do you need to do a lot of aggregation on those like for example you have a duration as a column and you want to run, you want to have an average of those duration or a percentile and a percentile of the duration a distributed columnar data store is ideal for that scenario due to the locality purposes in columnar databases all the values are written very near the are sequentially written to the disk right so it it becomes blazing fast queries so you so the aggregate queries are very fast and retrieving the columnar data are very fast apart from that click house has very good compression capabilities where it, whether it is lz4 or lz d or anything right so we are even signals we are able to achieve a good compression like 10 to 25 times uh, compression capabilities right and and as i have already mentioned click house has multiple tiers of storage which can be leveraged to store data that is frequently used and data that is less frequently used it can be associated dissociated into hot storage and cold cold storage right and generally people prefer using s3 as cold storage because it is cheap right now we come to discuss in a place like now we since we understand like what what is trace and what is span we like to discuss how is data modeled in click house using signals right so the list of events are called spans so events and spans are analogous to each other okay and every trace has a list of events inside them like a trace is a one particular request and as it goes through different components of your infrastructure different type of events are emitted and every event has rich contextual data with them sorry so we created a table looking like this in click house we tested out a few different uh, uh, patterns or architectures to store data and finally we settled with this one and furthermore it it is open to optimizations and all right everything is open source so we store data time data trace id spam id what is the service name that you have sent us what is the duration of that event and apart from that a lot of tags or annotations and the keys and the key value in the in the keys of these key value pairs the keys keep on changing so if you try to add each and every key as a separate column it becomes huge right the number of columns we can use and with every data you need to create new columns and this might explode the number of files that you write into disk right so this could this could be intensive now what we finally did is we created two arrays one to store the keys and another to store the values as you can see here i created an array of a string for the storing the keys and an array of a uh, string to create the tag values right? and clickhouse gives you a very easy way to find out the position of these keys so if you have to query by a key like you have a key called customer type and you have a value like gold and you want to query like how is the latency profile of that particular customer segment like customer type is equal to gold is looking to you right so those customer type and uh, the values will be stored here right? and clickhouse gives you a very easy way to find out the position of uh, customer type in this array and using the tag values you and that index you can easily find the values and do the filtering right and the indexing is done as clone filters apart from do that uh, since this is a bit more optimized than using each and every separate columns for their different values or different keys uh, 
this is a, this is i say it is optimized but not the best for for those tag keys for those keys that users are frequently querying the data for or the users of this observability platform are querying the data we we can create a separate column for them because they are frequently accessed right so i have done the same here the external http method and external http url and the db system the db name that you are accessing the, the operation that you are performing what is a select insert update or delete which kind of operation are you performing i have extracted all these out into a separate columns because because these will be much frequently accessed by the users of this platform right so this adds performance of those kinds of of, of queries right so the with even with yager there is an open issue in yager to suggest clickhouse as a storage plugin for yager and and people are working around that and very similar architecture people have uh, resorted to and it's it is very exciting to see such sort of architecture take, being uh, used in yager also right i tried to run a, a query to analyze how is the storage performing uh, by writing that data into clickhouse the number of rows were roughly around 8.8 .8 billion or 9 billions uh, the uncompressed data size was 3.1 gb after compression we could get it to 3 uh, 3, 3, 3 300 mbs right? roughly the compression ratio came out to be 10 it was good uh, for every row we had around we needed around 36 bytes so that, that seems pretty really good to me right? we can even optimize it further but uh, good good to start with right <laughs> Now we'll discuss how uh, how the ClickHouse model and things work out for log management uh, in using ClickHouse, right? So th there is a very interesting blog that I have mentioned. The link here also published by Uber very recently, I think in the, this month or last month only. Uh, they migrated from using Elasticsearch to using ClickHouse for their log management system. The problems they were having with Elasticsearch is operational complexity because the number of clusters exploded uh, exploded with them, and because of the huge amount of terabytes of data that we're write, writing a petabytes of data, right? And uh, apart from that, uh, the, they were they needed to run many more uh, aggregation queries, right? So they resorted to this architecture of for using ClickHouse. So they used to write log in Kafka clusters, and they had an ingester that that would uh, change the data format to be compatible and to be stored in ClickHouse. And it they would pass the data obviously to make it more efficient in writing to disk sequentially, and they would write it to ClickHouse cluster. They even had a better uh, a, a good uh, admin panel to uh, to have an uh, operational overview of the ClickHouse cluster. Right? And they had some uh, ingenious query service, which uh, would which would give them flexibility to write schemaless queries. Like the type conversions for the columns of the ClickHouse was taken care of after the UI has written a query, and the query service used to convert them into the correct types. Right. So these kind of optimizations are done by Uber uh, gave uh, an edge to ClickHouse to be, to manage huge amount of scale of logs data. And again, the logs data is very much contextual, right? Here I share uh, the model that they use to store data in ClickHouse, and again, it's from the same log, right? So they used to they used to dump the raw log event at uh, one column, and there are other col columns like host name, zone, timestamp, and all. Uh, they they also had type specific field names, like if it is a string, they would have an array of a string uh, as keys and the value separately if it's a number that they would have a number of uh, uh, float type values also right and if, if the uh, values are bools the boolean values they can they, they had an array of uh, unit eight right so this is the uh, data model that they followed and all the blocks there were two things that i could make out as compared to elastic search like uh, a single clickhouse node could ingest around 300,000 logs per second. That was 10 times more efficient than a single lasting node. Right? And they also observed that more than 80% of the queries that they had were aggregation queries, like histograms, percentiles, and response times, and all. And by definition, or by, by ingenuity, Elasticsearch is not designed to support fast aggregations. Right? And similarly, for metrics data, we had, we had this kind of models. Two tables, uh, one table used to store time series data, and another used to store the actual values of that type data. This 
is how the set of key value pairs or labels in a metric usually seem like. Like if you look into Prometheus, it is usually like this. What Prometheus does, and similarly we do here in Signals, we do, we create a, we do a hashing algorithm and we create a fingerprint for these labels and we store it in the time series table along with the labels that is meant to be. Right? And again, uh, here in the samples, it stores the values for those fingerprints. And the metrics have signals. So we we try to again run a query to optimize the story needs. So we ingested around 8.8 .8 billion, uh, 8.8 .8 billion rows, and they were taking around 236 GB uncompressed data. And with compression ratio of 25, we were achieved uh, able to achieve 9.5 GB of data, right? And every sample or every row was taking 1.16 bytes. And with Prometheus, this was 1.37 bytes. So it's not that bad, right? Again, we are doing some sort of uh, analyzing the performance of the queries or heavy and light queries in signals. And when that benchmark has, uh, is published as compared to Prometheus, we'd like to share with the community again. With in signals, we also support PromQL like queries, right? So Prometheus has a very powerful querying language like PromQL that you can have group buys and different aggregation functions and powerful filtering. So we'd like to retain that. And with Signals, you should be able to run those sort of queries to read data from the ClickHouse. So there's a few improvements that we are also planning in the coming days, right? So these, these, are, the, these are the few pointers that I noted down, like uh, in the span data or the trace data, we if we have to query a particular trace ID, it is not efficient to, to get the different column values and combine them together to get the data, right? It's more of a, like a document structure. We can have a separate table for to store the dump of data about trace ID and we can index by trace ID. So retrieving by trace ID will become very efficient. We can also use replicated merge tree for data redundancy. We can also use summing merge tree for faster aggregation queries like we used to show the distribution uh, latencies and error rates and RPS. So these can be uh, pre-aggregated into something using some uh, summing merge tree, right? That will increase performance and the storage needs also. We can also use distributed tracing for distributed queries. And so, so a distributed query can be uh, split into different, different nodes or the different uh, distributed tables written in different nodes and they can gather data and they can combine the data and give the final result, right? So that's the purpose of distributed query. And the last point that is my favorite, like separation of rules using separate data nodes and separate query nodes in ClickHouse, right? The, we can achieve independent scaling of writes and reads using these separate uh, separation of rules. And also we can have independent hardware SKU used for query and, uh, data nodes. For query nodes also, we can have distributed tables uh, so that the, the info that we need to transfer, the cluster info propagated along uh, all the clusters should be minimal, right? So these are, these are the advantages that we, we, can, we can improve and uh, imbibe into us. Yeah. To summarize, like, uh, like ClickHouse till now seems to be a very good fit for storing observability data. And with Signals, we plan to explore more about it. With Uber uh, migrating from Elastic to ClickHouse seems to be a very good move. And they have proven that ClickHouse can handle huge amount of scale, even for logs kind of data. And by nature of ClickHouse being a distributed columnar store, the aggregation capabilities will be very high. And that is that those sort of aggregation queries are also demanded by the users of such platforms like logs, span data metrics, all their aggregation is needed, right? So it becomes very much efficient when you use ClickHouse, right? And as I said, we we had a lot, we need to we were able to run signals using Druid and Kafka, and it took around 4.65 GB or 6 GB to get it up and running. With ClickHouse, all the signal setup setup takes less than a GB, right? So ClickHouse is very light in terms of resource needs. Right. And that makes it ideal for open source project like ours. Thank you folks very much. I hope you liked and do give a try uh, signals at uh, this GitHub link and uh, you can post any issues and reach out to me at ankitatsignals.io. I'm also available at Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you and open to questions. Hey, thanks Ankit, that was a great talk. Uh, I particularly like your visualization. We have uh, we had some questions come up during the talk, so let me just scroll back. 
Um, here's one which I believe was, uh, yeah, it was for you. It came up about 20 minutes in. How is ClickHouse compared to other solutions when you were selecting ClickHouse as a back end? And um, actually, the, 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 the uh, person asking this then narrowed it. Um, specifically, do you know how it is compared to Presto on S3 with columnar storage? Do you have any comments on that? Uh, I have not explored Presto too much, but uh, I again think for adoption at smaller teams and smaller companies, uh, Presto takes a huge amount of resources to get started with. But I have not benchmarked using Presto and S3 as a storage. I have looked into all the uh, row-oriented databases, uh, key-value stores databases, and columnar databases. Okay. And then you did cover, you know, some of the trade-offs with other databases. Right. Of course, you covered it. That, that this question came up before the, before yeah. we saw that slide. Great. Here's another one. Um, it, and it's a multi-part question and I'll, I'll read you the whole thing and you can, it's coming off YouTube um, from Ishan. Have you removed Kafka or is it part of the hotel collector? And if you removed it, how can we ensure failure at ClickHouse doesn't result in data loss? So, uh, Open telemetry does not provide uh, installation of Kafka also. So open telemetry has an exporter that can write to a Kafka topic. Or, right? So we have another installation steps using Helm chart and uh, you can use Kafka along with Druid. So we used to write to uh, Kafka topic and we used to do some sort of string processing and write to another topic. And from that topic, we used to read, uh, write data to Druid. Right? For ClickHouse, we are not using Kafka till now, but we, we plan to use it to handle bigger scales. We will uh, emit some sort of metrics uh, that is relevant to monitor the operational, operational uh, readiness and liveliness of Kafka, Open Telemetry Collector, and ClickHouse all together. If in future we use, if we use Kafka along with ClickHouse. But I guess ClickHouse also has buffers that can handle some amount of buffering data, right? So we will we'll have an operational dashboard that you can look into. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and, and Ishan uh, made a point that you can also use materialized view with application level uh, decoupling. There's there's a variety of ways that you can handle this mm -hmm. problem. Um, I don't see other, let me see if there's other questions um, uh, coming up. No, I don't see any more specific to signals. I did have one, if you don't mind, uh, since as moderator, I get to ask one. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the, the front end stack? I liked your graphics. Uh, how did you, what's the library you're using? Can you talk a little bit about how that's done? For the visualization, you mean? Yeah. So we used a React version of Chart.js. Okay, Chart.js. Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's, uh, I've seen a number of other people. And is your, did you go through any iteration on that, deciding which, or were right. you just React people? We actually looked into multiple libraries before going to, so we had a few specs like we have to, uh, like this capabilities has to be enabled. We have to select one node and then enable clicking. It has to be uh, very much visible, the circles and all. So we did a research on a couple of other libraries. I don't know. So one was Recharts. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't remember a couple of others. One was Ant Designed Inbuilt Charts also. They were Google Charts also. But eventually we liked the flexibility and uh, the control we have over uh, Chart.js libraries. Like we can okay. customize them and we plan to customize them and build specifically for Signals. Cool. Thank you very much. Good. I think that um, and uh, by the way, it's just not apparent to everybody. Ankit and Pranay are, are dialing in from the Indian subcontinent. Continent. We appreciate your sacrifice. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, if there are more questions, I, I hope you guys can stick around a little bit. If there are more questions, folks, feel free to, to put them in the question and answer box. Um, oh, uh, one question, a quick question that I think could be answered. Um, it, uh, has this project been ben benchmarked against the Grafana stack? Uh, no, not any. No. We okay. plan to do it in the next quarter. Okay, great. Then you can come back and tell us about it. Yeah. Excellent. As the next speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce Alexander Sopin, or as some of us know him, Sasha Sopin. As I said at the beginning, he's leading the project to replace Zookeeper inside of ClickHouse. And I'd like to go ahead and just... Uh, uh, Sasha, if you want to go ahead and share your slides, uh, take over. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Can you hear me? Perfectly. 
Oh yeah, everything okay. Let me share my slides. Uh -huh. Okay, presentation is visible or not? Uh, no? It's, vis or it's visible. Oh, okay, thank you. Two thumbs up. Uh, for some reason, I see slightly darker slides, but okay. okay. It, actually, I do see I do see darker slides. That's a little bit strange. It looks like it's oh, um, it strange. Uh, it's still readable. Well, let me let me try to share them one more time. I don't know. <laughs> okay, let me try to stop share and share screen one more time. Okay. You got everything it. It's should, yes, it's, everything it's great. Should be okay. Now. okay. Hi everyone, Robert have already introduced me and I am, my name is Alexander, I am software engineer at ClickHouse team and today I am going to tell you about our replacement for the Keeper, which is called ClickHouse Keeper. My presentation is divided into three parts. First of all, we will talk about consensus problem in general. And don't be afraid, I'm not going to give a lecture on distributed system, just some general idea. After that, we will talk about Zookeeper and ClickHouse, because ClickHouse Keeper is a replacement for it, and ClickHouse used Zookeeper for a long time. And in the, in the end of the presentation, I'll give you some details about ClickHouse Keeper, how to use it, and current status. Also, I have such introduction slide. I hope everyone here knows everything which is placed, almost everything that is placed on this slide. But just to be sure, I'll say that ClickHouse is a fast analytical DBMS which is open source and it has a reliable distributed storage which is called replicated merge tree. It is leader leader eventually consistent replication and for this ClickHouse use Zookeeper under the hood. And Zookeeper use, uh, ClickHouse use Zookeeper for a long time, but it has a lot of minuses or cons. It is written in Java, and embedded into ClickHouse server. It additional servers, additional operations. So at one moment we decide that we need something better and we decided to replace Zookeeper with ClickHouse Keeper. Okay. It was a short intro. Now I'll tell you something about consensus problem. Of course, in, we all know that in modern world applications are distributed. Uh, our programs runs on the multiple independent servers which communicate via network. And in such systems, a lot of failures may happen. There can be network errors, processes failures, and disk crashes and so on. And also, uh, it is set, but no reliable clocks exist in this world if you not Google. If you Google, some kind of reliable clock may exist. And everything works well almost all the time, but sometimes agreement on some data in our distributed system is required. And there are many cases like leader election, load balancing, when we need to achieve some agreement on some data. But actually, what does it mean to achieve agreement in distributed system? First of all, we need that every process in a finite amount of time agrees that this value will be exactly this value. Well, also, if every process, a live process or correct process propose some value V, then any other alive process must also agree on V. And of course, every alive process must agree on the same value. But actually in real world, agreement on a single value is not interesting at all. In real world, consensus system or consensus algorithms achieve agreement on state machines. And state machine, it can be anything, but it should have some state and have some operations or transition, or transitions which allows you to move from one state to another. And also there is such implementation detail like log. Uh, a lot of consensus algorithms, first of all, store operations in some log, and after that, apply them to the state machine. This log may be explicit or implicit, but it is used in a large amount of algorithms. And for example, we can have a distributed hash table. State machine here will be just normal in memory hash table in your favorite language. Operations here will be also common operations for hash tables like set, get, erase, and so on. 
And we can have uh, such example of three operations like set x equal five, set y equals 10 and so on. But uh, just imagine that we have a uh, different servers which execute different operations uh, on some state, maybe concurrently. And what about order of operations in each system? For example, we can apply our three operations in one order and get one state of our state machine or apply them in another order and get absolutely different state. So <clears throat> the order of operations in a distributed system determined by such concept which called consistency model. There are a lot of different consistency models with different guarantees. Of course, we'd like that our, uh, our application, will, our distributed operations will be executed like in a single threaded application on a single server. But uh, this model is very strict. It is not, <clears throat> it has bad performance. And today we will be interested in these two consistency models. Uh, one of them called linearizability and second one called sequential consistency. Linearizability is a more strict model. And what does it mean that your distributed system is linearizable? It means that all operations which happens with your state machine apply it in some real time order. And what is more important, each observer of your distributed system observes the same most fresh state. And sequential consistency is a less strict model. Operations here is also applied in a real time order to the state machine, but some observers can see stale state. Okay. I have a very simple picture uh, why consensus is important and also operations is important. Imagine that our state machine is a bank account, which actually is a positive integer. We have two operations, deposit and withdraw some amount of dollars. And we have our distributed system with five servers and two clients. For example, client one connected to the server one and want to deposit some amount of money Server one accepts these requests and communicate in some way with other servers. We don't speaking about concrete algorithm, concrete algorithms here. So it just communicate in some way and they decide that this record is okay. It can be written to the log as you can see. And after that, they all apply this operation to their state machines and server one replies okay to the client one. But imagine that both clients concurrently want to withdraw some amount of money in this case, we don't want to have a negative balance. It will broke our state machine in some sense, break our state machine in some sense. So in this case, servers must communicate with each other and decide who was the first, who was the second. Uh, and uh, we would like that it will be in a real time order. And for example, client one was the first. So this operations will be written to the log and applied to the state machine. So the first server, this fourth server will reply to type client to okay, and the server one will reply not okay to the client one. Okay, it was just a simple picture. Order operations is important in distributed systems. Of course, consensus problem was solved multiple times. Uh, I have some consensus algorithms here, which will in which we will be interested today. And I think the most famous algorithm was developed by Leslie Lampert. And actually it is not an algorithm, it's a family of algorithms called Paxos. Uh, but there, will, <clears throat> there are some other algorithms like Zookeeper Atomic Broadcast. It is a separate consensus algorithm which allows to achieve linearizability in distributed system. And also the most, mm, I don't know how to say it, understandable <laughs> consensus algorithm is Raft and this, algorithm also quite famous and actually was invented just about seven years ago. So it is not too old. It is just an algorithm, not a practical system. Of course, there are a lot of practical systems. For example, for coordination, we have the keeper, ETCD, console, this system solved consensus problem. Also, we have a key value storages that also solve consensus problem, not especially with these three algorithms, they can use different algorithms. And actually there are a lot of different systems, databases, streaming processing systems, which solve consensus problems. But by ClickHouse need to solve 
consensus problem. As I said on the intro slide, the most important case is a replicated merge tree. Replicated merge tree is distributed replicated state machine, which implements leader leader eventually consistent replication. Um, um, it requires consensus mount actually in several places. For example, when you insert data to some replica of the replicated merge tree, replicated merge tree allocates a unique block number for this data. And it is a basic invariant, all data, all different data parts must have different block numbers. And for example, the replicated merge tree have background merges and replicas tries, always tries to assign merges concurrently and we don't want to get intersecting merges. So here we want to have a consensus. We need consensus system for replicated merge tree. Also, we have a distributed DDL queries uh, also, you may know them as on cluster queries. This question, this query is actually executed also by some distributed state machine with own load. And here we need consensus to emulate distributed queue. And also sometimes for distributed locking because some queries must be executed only on a single server on the shard. So what are the main properties or the main requirements for consensus in ClickHouse for consensus system, which will be suitable or appropriate for ClickHouse. ClickHouse store small amount of data in which requires consensus. It, allow, it requires linearizability for writes because we don't need, we don't want to write operations like block number allocation and merges assignment. And also replicated merge tree in ClickHouse is highly available. So our consensus of the system also must be highly available. And I think a lot of a lot of you heard about it. The ClickHouse use Zookeeper for this task for consensus. All replicated merge tree metadata stored in Zookeeper and all new merges, block numbers allocations are also done with help of Zookeeper. Also, DDL queries log or DDL queries queue stored in Zookeeper, and also ClickHouse use Zookeeper as distributed notification system. Mm. A lot of people asking us why Zookeeper, mostly because of historical reasons. The Zookeeper is very old, battle-tested consensus system, but not only historical reason. Actually, Zookeeper has simple and powerful API, appropriate state machine. We don't need anything else than Zookeeper provides. It allows you to combine, for example, different operations into multi-transactions and execute them atomically. It has watches, which allows you to implement distributed notification and has quite good performance for read operations. So I'll give you some details about Zookeeper. Zookeeper has a very simple state machine or data model and simple and also powerful actually. Uh, it is file system like distributed hash table, uh, but there is no difference between files and directories. Each node in this file system can both have data and both have children. Nodes in Zookeeper have stats. For example, there are version of data, there, are number of there is number of children and so on. And also in Zookeeper state machine, there is no data types. Everything is just a simple stream. Zookeeper has its own client protocol over TCP. It is persistent protocol, so client connect to Zookeeper server, uh, he receives session ID and communicate with server, and server can communicate with client, and so on. Main operations of uh, Zookeeper state machine are read operations and write operations. Read operations are quite simple for file system, so you can get the content of the node, you can list children of the node, you can check that node exists and so on. Also, write operations, there, there are write operations like send some data into node, create some node and remove some node and so on. These operations are quite simple and easy to understand. Also, write operations can be combined into multi-transactions so they will be executed atomically. For example, you can create some node and remove another node in one operation. Okay, also the Keeper State Machine has some interesting features. One of them is ephemeral nodes. 
uh, it is a special type of nodes. Uh, you can specify node type when you create this node and ephemeral nodes disappear when client or session who created this node disconnects from the server. It is quite powerful thing, for example, when you want to implement distributed logging. If log holder dead, then log will be automatically disappeared. Also, the Zookeeper has sequential nodes. It is also special kind of nodes. When you create node with flag sequential, it will Zookeeper automatically will add increasing 10 digit number to its name. It can be useful, for example, for what in ClickHouse we use it for block numbers allocation, but there are a lot of different patterns how you can use sequential nodes. And also nodes in Zookeeper can be both sequential and ephemeral. And, and ClickHouse use all of these Zookeeper state machine features. Also, there are some features in API. For example, you can each client can subscribe to changes of some nodes in Zookeeper. For example, you can subscribe when uh, and get notification when node is deleted or children is created for some node and so on. It is also a very powerful thing. And also there is a controversial feature called session restore. Uh, in Zookeeper, when you disconnect from server, you can connect to another server or the same server with the same session ID which you received from server initially. And probably you will see the same state of Zookeeper but actually, this is not very reliable feature, because mostly because of ephemeral nodes. They may already disappear or can be still alive. And actually, in ClickHouse, we don't use it. And I don't recommend you to use it in your applications. Also, Zookeeper has pluggable ACL and authentication system. We implemented it in the ClickHouse Keeper, but it is the most strangest implementation of authentication and ACL I have ever seen. For example, just one example, you can have different users, oh, same users with different passwords. Yes, to, so it will be different users. It's quite strange. I think. Okay. Uh, what about Zookeeper internals? What about consistency guarantees? Zookeeper is linearizable for write operations. So all your write operations always consistent. You see consistent state when you execute write operations. But read operations like get, exist, and so on are sequentially, cons are sequentially consistent, and they are executed locally by each Zookeeper quorum participant. Uh, write requests, my, all write requests in Zookeeper go through leader. Of course, Zookeeper has atomical multi transactions, and uh, as linearizability requires, there is no, there are no rollbacks of committed writes in Zookeeper. Zookeeper has its own implementation of consensus algorithm. It's called Zookeeper Atomic Broadcast. I'm not sure that any other system uses the same algorithm, but they can exist. Maybe I just didn't hear about them. Operations, all operations, both read and write, are read impotent in Zookeeper. They store it in log files on file system. And also, of course, we cannot store all our history of operations in log and apply this log on the server start. Zookeeper creates snapshots of its state machine, also stores them on disk and remove outdated logs, which are not required anymore. And what, what is interesting about Zookeeper, Zookeeper scales linearly for read operations. You add more servers, you get better reads and inverse linear for write operations. So when you have too many servers, you will get slower write operations because all of them must be committed by quorum and must go through one bigger server. For ClickHouse, Zookeeper has both pros and cons. Uh, the main pros of Zookeeper, not only for ClickHouse, but actually just the main pros that is that Zookeeper is a battle-tested consensus system. It is very important for consensus systems. Also, Zookeeper has an appropriate data model and quite simple protocol. So we are implemented our own Zookeeper client inside ClickHouse written in C++. We don't use native C client, which is provided by Zookeeper authors. But there are a lot of cons. For example, <laughs> Zookeeper written in Java. It is not uh, cons by itself, but we just can ClickHouse written in C++. So we can cannot embed it in Zookeeper into ClickHouse. Also, we cannot run it on the same server. 
So the keeper always requires separate servers and it is difficult to operate. You have to tune Java machine. Also, there are some um, strangers, strangers in Zookeeper like the ZX ID overflow. I don't want to explain what is it, what it is, but on heavy loaded clusters, sometimes, rarely, maybe once a month, Zookeeper can become unavailable for some for one minute or 30 seconds. It is just unavoidable, it is by design. And for a long time, Zookeeper had uncompressed logs and snapshots. Now Zookeeper in the latest version allow you to have compressed snapshots, but for some reason, at least at Yandex, nobody used compressed snapshots in, in Zookeeper. I don't know why, maybe something wrong with them. I don't know. Also checksums in Zookeeper are also optional and it can, can lead to some very complex errors. And uh, also another cons of Zookeeper is that it develops quite slowly. They don't have new operations, for example, for state machine. And I don't want to say the project is dead, but uh, it, not, it doesn't develop in click. It does develop in click house speed. So we decided that we need something more appropriate for us, or something better. And we decided to replace Zookeeper with click house keeper. Click house keeper is almost fully compatible replacement for Zookeeper. It has a compatible client protocol, so all your favorite Zookeeper clients will work out of the box. It has the same state machine and the same data model. It optionally allows linearizable reads, so it has better, optionally better guarantees and has comparable performance, slightly better for reads and similar for writes, but I think we will improve performance in the, uh, for the next time. Okay, implementation. Clickhouse Keeper, of course, written in C++, so we can bundle it into a Clickhouse. It is already bundled into Clickhouse server package. It is built on top Raft algorithm, and we just take implementation from eBay, which is called New Raft. And as I said before, it is can it can be used as standalone application or can be embedded into Clickhouse server. What are um, also out of the box, there are some advantages, other advantages over Zookeeper. We have checksums everywhere and logs and snapshots and internal protocol. I think this is quite a good advantage. Also, we have compressed snapshots by default now. You, you can turn off this feature. And also we are going to implement compressed logs. Uh, I'm ag I, again, I have some pictures. So I want to show you how some operations works in ClickHouse Keeper in action. For example, we have a ClickHouse Keeper cluster of three nodes uh, and some client. You may have already heard that the Keeper, uh, that Raft is protocol with dedicated leader. So when you start up ClickHouse cluster, uh, ClickHouse Keeper cluster, one node will be elected as leader and other nodes will be followers. And leader will send her bits to the followers. Uh, yeah, yes, on this picture, leader is a blue rectangle and followers are green rectangles. Also, as I said before, you can use any Zookeeper client. We have already tested native Java client, closure client, our C++ client, and Python Kazoo client. And I think all other clients will also work out of the box without any special settings of team. Okay, Yuma Raft is a protocol with dedicated leader and also all requests in Raft are go through leader. So, but for clients, it is not suitable because you have to know who is leader, connect to this node. If this node failed, you, you have to know who is leader now and connect to this node. So we implemented the request forwarding in ClickHouse Keeper. You can connect to actually to any node. It can be follower, it can be leader. And if it is follower, it will just forward all write requests to the leader. So let's execute some write request. For example, we want to create node N1 with the data hello, and we are connected to the follower node. As I said before, follower will forward this request to leader. And first of all, leader will try to append this request to the log on the quorum of nodes and, <coughs> and to its own log. So it just appends this 
request to its own log and it sent uh, to folder nodes request to append this entry to their logs. And some of nodes may respond faster. For example, our folder respond, append this entry into its log and respond OK. And we already have two nodes of three who appended this record to the log. So leader have quorum and can commit this entry. So it is committed to the leader state machine. And after some time, followers will also understand that they can commit this request. They will commit they, this request. They will commit it to their own state machines and respond OK to the client. Uh, this is how write works. Write operation works. So read, op read operations much simpler. So you just send request read request to any node and as in zookeeper click housekeeper process this request locally and just respond okay to the client but the state uh, which is observed by, by this client with read operation can be quite stable and it is not a problem in click house and also uh, i just showed you normal operate i just shown you normal operation of click housekeeper also, leader may fail, followers may fail, everything may fail, but uh, the housekeeper must uh, recover from this bad state. So we have a lot of tests uh, where we're trying to kill the housekeeper in different scenarios. So first of all, uh, we replaced our ordinary tests for click house for replicated merge tree. Uh, we replace the keeper in this test with click housekeeper, and in this test, uh, click housekeeper work in a single node mode, most simplest mode. Also, in we have a lot of integration tests in click house which use zookeeper. So here we also replaced the keeper with click housekeeper, and it works in three nodes mode. And of course, we have a separate test for click housekeeper functionality. But what is more interesting, we have tests written with Jepson framework. If you didn't hear about Jepson, just go you, with this link. And it is very interesting general purpose framework for distributed system testing. It, uh, this framework written in Clojure. So we also wrote our tests in Clojure. And what is important, Jepson has embedded consistency checks of your system. So it has some models and it can check different scenarios and also introduce failures like no crashes like network partitions in very different scenarios like disk corruptions, network slowdowns, and actually this list is extremely big. And the keeper also have some has some tests written in Jepson, but we have more of them, and we have already found about five serious bugs, both in Neuraf and unfortunately in our code, and all of them were fixed. And we run Jepson in our CI for 24 hours for seven days a week. Okay, how to use Click Housekeeper? What if you want to try? Uh, as I said before, uh, the, there are two modes. You can install Click Housekeeper as standalone application as a replacement for the keeper, or you can use it inside Click House server. Configuration of Click House is a very simple. We have our documentation, and if you use Click House, it is very similar .xml file. And actually, you can use same config for both Click House server and standalone Click House keeper. Of course, but of course, configuration must be equal for all forum participants, participants which you in Click House keeper. Also, we have some general recommendations, and these recommendations are very similar both for Zookeeper and for Click Housekeeper and actually for almost any consensus coordination system. Uh, the most important part, you it is better to place directory with logs, with Click Housekeeper rough logs to the independent fast disk if it is possible. Also, don't try to have a lot of forum participants. It will slow down your write operations. And uh, Click Housekeeper support configuration changes, but don't try to remove or add more than one server at once. So, hey, Sasha, just a quick question. Is anybody? Sorry. Sorry, Robert, what, what's wrong? Are we getting, um, is anybody getting extra audio? Oh. Just, just sorry to interrupt. 
I want to just. No, I don't hear it. Okay, great. Go ahead. I think I've got a, a streaming issue, but it's just me. Thank you. Uh, please continue. Uh, also, uh, you can run Clickhouse Keeper as a standalone application, and it is quite simple. You just specify pass to config, and uh, you can run it in a diamond mode, which is most suitable for production usage. And also, you can run it just in your console for some testing. The simplest configuration for Clickhouse Keeper looks like this in a single node mode. Uh, you just have to specify TCP port for client connection. You just specify server identifier. It can be any positive number. Uh, you specify pass to your storage. You can specify pass for both uh, snapshots and logs, as in this example, but also you can specify separate pass for logs and for snapshots. We have some settings for Click Housekeeper and for sync is uh, is a quite famous setting in Zookeeper. You can turn it off, Zookeeper will work faster. Click Housekeeper always will work faster when you turn off F-Sync, but it will have less strict guarantees. It is not recommended to turn the settings off, to turn the setting off. Also, there is a section called draft configuration, and here you just specify your quorum participants. Their host names, their ports for internal raft communication, and their identifiers. And also, there are some other sections, which is also we have in our documentation, or maybe some of them are not documented. You try to do. Okay. Uh, but uh, this is the simplest configuration for a single node. It is useful only for development. Don't try to use something similar for production. Okay, what, what, which configurations we can use for production? Uh, for example, uh, we can have standalone keeper cluster just as a replacement for the keeper. If you hate the keeper, you can just remove it and run Clickhouse Keeper on the same nodes. And all Clickhouse cluster nodes will connect to this keeper cluster and as before, as for the keeper. But it is not very interesting. Uh, the more interesting configuration shown here. Uh, if you have different shards, you can install Clickhouse Keeper on each shard separately, and uh, each shard will use its own Clickhouse Keeper quorum, and some nodes will connect uh, to their Clickhouse Keeper, some of them will connect to some other Clickhouse Keeper nodes, for example, because they have very slow disks, but they want to see more fresh state of the metadata, for, for example, to replace, uh, for replicating their screen. But uh, this configuration has uh, one flaw. You can't use distributed DVL or on cluster queries uh, because uh, in this example, uh, because for on cluster queries, uh, you must have one single zookeeper which, uh, is see, uh, which all nodes use. Uh, in this example, each, uh, each shard is separate click housekeeper. So uh, you can have another configuration. For example, you have one powerful shard. You run Clickhouse Keeper on these nodes, and all other nodes just connect to it. And in this case, you can use both uh, replicated merge tree and on classic queries. It will work well. Also, you can have a combination of configuration two and configuration three. For replication, you can use per shard Clickhouse Keeper. For distributed DDL, you can use one powerful shard in your cluster. It will also work as well. Okay, some settings. Uh, we have, as I said before, some documentation, but uh, if you have uh, slow disk, so you have uh, enormous network latency, try to increase following settings. Actually, uh, you have to increase election time lower bound MS and election time up, timeout upper bound MS. Uh, as you remember, click, uh, click house keeper leader send hard beats to followers, and if they don't hear for hard beats for some amount of time, actually this interval amount of time, they will start new leader election. So if your hard beats uh, goes through the very slow network, just increase this interval and everything will work out. Uh, but don't try to make this interval huge because in uh, rare cases, uh, you will have very slow write operations. Also, uh, we can specify some nodes as observers, and it can be done in rough configuration C section. This can become leader settings. 
observer receive all updates, but uh, observer receive all updates, but it doesn't participate in quorum. It doesn't slow down quorum. For example, if you have most of your nodes in Europe and one of quorum participants in USA, you can make this participant observer. Also, uh, in Click Housekeeper, we use semi deterministic leader election algorithm. So, if one of your Click Housekeeper nodes is more powerful than other, you can set higher priority for this node and it will become leader more often according to priority. And also we have experimental support of linearizable reads. Uh, you can turn this on with quorum read settings, but it is not required by ClickHouse and currently it is quite inefficient implementation. Uh, we use it uh, while we're testing ClickHouse Keeper with checks. Also, if you want to migrate from the Keeper, Clickhouse Keeper protocol and the Keeper protocol internal protocols are incompatible. So seamless migration is impossible. But we have a separate tool, which is called Clickhouse Keeper Converter, uh, which allows you to keep your internal data to the Clickhouse Keeper snapshot. We checked this tool on the Keeper 3.4 plus versions for 3.4, 3.6. Mm, yes, I think it is the latest version. And it is also bundled into ClickHouse server package, just the same link to the main binder. So how to migrate? First of all, stop all the keeper nodes, go to the former leader of the keeper node, start it and stop it again. It sounds stupid, but it is the only way to force the keeper to create new fresh consistent snapshot. Uh, there is a pull request in the keeper repository uh, which add a comment to create snapshot, but this pull request is not even merged now. Uh, and you can run ClickHouse Keeper Converter with the following command. It is quite simple. You just specify path to the Keeper logs dir, to the Keeper snapshots directory, and output path for ClickHouse Keeper snapshot. You just, after that, you can just copy ClickHouse Keeper snapshot to all ClickHouse Keeper nodes or Combine it with how server and with how keeper nodes and start them. And this is the, this how migration from the keeper looks like. What is current status of click house keeper? Current status of click house keeper is pre production. We are testing it in our internal Yandex cloud installations. We, it is tested by Antinity. <clears throat> and if you want to try it, and I recommend you to try it. Uh, just read the documentation. Just uh, if you want more complex configure, if you want to look at some examples, check our integration tests with test keeper prefix. Also, you may want to read some docs from Mura. What are our next steps? Uh, first of all, we have to implement four letter words introspection interface, which is quite strange, but it is implemented in the keeper, and there are a lot of tools who use this interface, so we must have something similar to be compatible. We are going to implement compressed logs. As I said before, it is not, not a big deal. In ClickHouse, ClickHouse we have very good compression support. And also, we are going to implement quite complex feature, which is called Elastic Quorum Configuration. So you, should, you don't have to care uh, you, you don't have to care about your quorum configuration. You just specify that all your ClickHouse servers can be quorum participants. And, and under the hood, ClickHouse Keeper will select one of them as actual quorum participants. Other nodes will know who are quorum participants. If some node fails, it will add another node. But this feature is quite complex. And I think, uh, but it, it is not impossible. We are going to implement it. And actually, that is all. Thank you for attention. I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you, Alexander. That was an absolutely awesome talk. I didn't know you were such a deep distributed systems guy. So uh, but I'm, I'm now much better informed. We do have a bunch of questions. Um, so uh, I'm going to run through them. You've covered a lot of these already. But I think it's useful to go over them. So there's a question that came up early. And, and I think this. Um, which is, is it okay to run ClickHouse Keeper on the same nodes as ClickHouse Server? Asking because for ZooKeeper, the ClickHouse docs recommended against it. And that's well known. Now you covered that, you know, the fact that it can, it's bundled, but maybe you could talk about the trade-offs 
in terms of you know, like running it separate versus um, versus local? Uh, if you have a separate small quite fast disk where you can store logs uh, in the, on the same server, it is mm -hmm. absolutely okay and it is intended scenario. But for example, in our cloud, we just have quite heavy loaded servers with SS, uh, with HDDs and uh, guys just <laughs> install the ClickHouse Keeper on the same disks. And it, is wor it works also quite well, but not fast, it works slow. So they have to tune election time election timeout bound. But if you have a separate disk, at least if you have a separate HDD, it will, it will work well and it is intended scenario. Great. Um, in the along similar lines with um, with ClickHouse plus Zookeeper, there were recommendations to run all the Z Zookeeper nodes in the same data center or within 50 milliseconds of each other. Uh, has ClickHouse Keeper changed this requirement in any way? Uh, no, actually it doesn't change this, requ uh, this requirement. Uh, uh, you can specify some nodes and observers, they can be actually anywhere. Uh, it is not important, but if you have large network latency, you can tune settings with election timeout bounds, uh, but uh, you know, it is not recommended. Yes, it is better to have all the keeper nodes all the house keeper knows the same as the keeper. Right. Um, I think this is another one you covered, but um, I'd probably be good to expand on this. Is it recommended to use ClickHouse Keeper in production? And I think the answer is really no, but maybe you could expand on when it might be safe to do that. Uh, the faster you try it, the faster it will become safe yeah. to do it. Uh, and it is the only answer uh, because no, Currently, we don't know about any serious bugs which will lead to uh, which will lead to consensus crash or something like this. But we, we have some small bugs which is reported by our uh, by Yandex Cloud or from Antinity, and we will fix them soon. But the faster a lot of people try it, the faster it became production ready. So now it is not a prototype; it is not a toy example. You can try it on your testing environment. It's okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Great. And in fact, that did, uh, uh, I think, uh, handle one of the um, it, it questions that we had from YouTube, which was um, was very, uh, and I'll, I'll get to the YouTube questions in a, in a second. I've got one out of chat, and I think this is one for us that Tatiana, by the way, I, I apologize for not um um, introducing Tatiana Saltikova, who's on as a um, as a panelist. I think everybody who's been on Telegram uh, and, and any Altinity customer knows Tatiana. She's like support engineer, kind of an amazing human being. And so she already answered this. Uh, but the question was: Is is Keeper already supported in the um, in the ClickHouse operator? Um, and we're testing it. So, and and it will be supported in the in the ClickHouse operator, so you can use it in Kubernetes. Uh, there was a um, a question here. Did you consider the Yandex famous internal Raft implementation from the YT project? Was that? Um, I don't. Uh, I, if you, I, I don't know if you looked the, at that. I understand this question. We look at that, but our internal Raft implementation is a monster. <laughs> it is a huge, very complex system. Actually, it is uh, even, I don't know how to say, it is beyond Raft, actually. It is a very complex system and we don't need such thing in ClickHouse. Also, there is a, an open source implementation called BRAFT from Baidu. And it is also very rich, very, very simple implementation, but we don't need powerful implementation for ClickHouse Keeper. So we took small embedded implementation of Raft from Italy. Great. We've got a few. Um, here's one. I'm just going to go in reverse order, actually, on from YouTube. YouTube. Is it possible to migrate uh, to CH Keeper without stopping all ZooKeeper nodes? Uh, if you can stop all requests to ZooKeeper nodes, it is possible. But without stop, you will get some stale state. So you have to stop them for sure, to be sure. Yeah. So one thing, just to be clear, you know, from your presentation, I 
you know, from the way you described it, it sounds like you're going to have to stop writes and you can't do distributed DDL, but you can continue to have reads on the systems while this, while the migration is going, uh, going on. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, theoretically, it is correct, but Zookeeper is a very complex system. So uh, there are uh, default snapshots of Zookeeper can be quite inconsistent with logs, but in Click Housekeeper, we tested such scenarios and mm -hmm. it seems like it works well, it works okay, but for huge snapshots, I cannot be sure. So it is recommended to stop the keeper and start the housekeeper. But yes, theoretically, it will work well. Oh, yeah. And w one of the things I wanted to be clear about is during that process, let's assume you follow that process. It, like if you're doing queries on distributed tables, they don't use Zookeeper anyway. So they should continue to function. Is that oh, of, correct? Of, of course, of course. Everything. Yeah. Okay. Great. I think that's important. That makes the migration. It's it's really like you've got to stop. You'd probably want to stop ingest while you're doing this, but you don't necessarily. You're you can still con can continue to have reads and aggregation yes. and things like yes. that. Yes. Cool. Okay. Great. Um, let's see. Uh, there was a question. Do you plan on enabling migration from Zookeeper? And it sounds like you've already answered that. There is a procedure. Do you have further thoughts on migration? Um, will there be things have developed on in addition to that? Uh, actually, the keeper doesn't change their data or their snapshots. So maybe we will implement some high level interface when you like for ClickHouse Copy, when you specify mm -hmm. just Zookeeper nodes and ClickHouse Keeper nodes and one tool do everything under the hood. But some other additions, conversion of the keeper snapshots is quite simple. Mm -hmm. There is nothing to add. To okay, great. Um, here was a, a question which you partially answered. So I'll, um, the, it, the original thing was, are there plans to in, implement ClickHouse Keeper into ClickHouse? Of course, your talk answered that as in the affirmative, but he, he went on to say, or she, or whoever asked the question, um, I really like how Cassandra has designed its clustering. You can simply set a replication factor and add and remove nodes on the fly. Um, can you comment on your design versus how, you know, versus how, I don't know if you're familiar with Cassandra, but I think you know what the drift uh, of this I, question I, is. I understand it is, yes, uh, it is related to my last bullet on my slides to the Elastic Quorum configuration mm -hmm. uh, and New Raft, uh, New Raft implementation and actually Raft algorithm itself support quorum changes when you just can specify new nodes, can remove old nodes and everything works well under the hood. And currently okay, you can use only fixed configuration, but yes, we are going to implement something similar. Okay, great. Yeah, that, that, that sounds really important. And we've had a number of other questions pop up in, in the Zoom chat. Let me read them off. Uh, well, first of all, uh, congratulations, amazing work. Yay, I think everybody probably agrees with that. Uh, can the server ID and the configuration XML be interpolated from macros? Like from macros.xml? Uh, uh, this is, uh, I think, actually, I, I haven't tried, but uh, this configuration is parsed, is ClickHouse config parser. So it should work the same as for ClickHouse. Okay. Um, Here's one from uh, actually uh, uh, from Gene. Hi, Gene. Uh, will some configurations, for example, shard based for ClickHouse Keeper, limit the capability of replication? For example, small tables that are fully replicated across all shards. Uh, if you have uh, small tables replicated across all, all shards, it is impossible if you have pair shard ClickHouse. Right. Keeper. Okay. You just have to use, for example, one powerful share is ClickHouse is click is, is click Keeper for these tables. You, in ClickHouse, you can have different connect, connections to different the keepers for different tables and for distributed DDL, it's okay. Okay, great. Yeah, that, um, yeah, definitely something to, uh, to learn about here. Okay, here's, uh, okay, I knew this was coming. Great question from Larry Snizek. Is there anything that makes ClickHouse Keeper not a fully fledged C++ implementation of Zookeeper usable in other scenarios than ClickHouse? 
I'm curious to see if it could replace my Kafka Zookeeper as part of the same logging pipeline. I think there's actually two answers, but I'll let you have a first crack at it. Uh, uh, as a, if, I, if I understand correctly, uh, yes, ClickHouse Keeper is fully fledged implementation of Zookeeper and C++. Uh, and as I said before, you can even have some better guarantees optionally. And I think we will implement some uh, other features in ClickHouse Keeper, but yes, you can replace your Kafka Zookeeper with ClickHouse Keeper. It should work absolutely well. There should be no problems, but as I heard, Kafka has their own consensus implementation. Maybe right, that's the second use. answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it's a great question, but it's I, in the case of Kafka, I would definitely go look at that first. They um, I believe they announced, well, they announced this months ago that they, and it's, they claim it's production ready. So, but definitely, yeah, I think, um, I think we're all eager to see replacements. Um, yeah, so is the plan, um, okay. So there's, uh, from Pachiko, there's almost identical questions. So I think we've got an answer for that. I'm just looking across uh, to see if there are any other questions uh, questions here i think we got most of them just looking in the chat um what i'd like to suggest now is we do have um tatiana is here um alexander maybe you can hang around for a little bit uh, but we can open it up to general clickhouse uh uh questions um so we've also got alexi milovidov on uh on zoom in fact i'm going to go ahead and uh promote Alexi to a panelist. And what I'd like to suggest to everybody is that we go till the top of the hour. We're happy to, to stand around, but it's very late for um, uh, for Alexander and others. And uh, so we'll, we'll close this up at, uh, at 2 p.m. Um, there was a question that came up, which I'd like to open up for the crowd. Um, this is an interesting one. Given the option between a, lar a single large ClickHouse node or many much smaller nodes with the same total quantity of resources, which would result in better aggregation performance? For example, large sum queries. Anybody want to take a crack at that at that question? And I'm Maybe thinking either Tatiana or Alexi. <laughs> I'm not sure, but. Uh... Yeah. It is a complex question. What yeah. do you understand? What do you, what do you mean by small nodes? Uh, if you have, <laughs> for example, in our in our Yandex cloud, a lot of users use nodes with two gigabytes of RAM or four gigabytes of ROM. And uh, uh, if you want to replace your big node with such tiny nodes, uh, it will not work better than one big node for aggregation. Uh, one, you know, one kind of obvious problem that you have with smaller nodes is memory, um, because aggregation tends to aggregation and uh, uh, tends to be fairly memory intensive. For example, if you're working with arrays or uniques, you know, you're dragging around um, these these large data structures. So, if you go to smaller nodes, the, the the likelihood that you're going to hit a case where you just run out of memory temporarily becomes a lot higher. So. Um, I would definitely echo uh, what Alexander says. It, it depends. It's a complex question. And we always say, try benchmarking it. Um, I would not put the, I would not roll this out without testing it carefully on real data. All right. Um, let's see. Um, oh, here we go. I can't, here's another, oh, you're going to get the, this, your ears are going to be burning. I can't stress enough how impressive this work is. Congratulations again, Alexander. Uh, thank you. That's a great, I think that really uh, summarizes a lot of the, comments here. There was a question here, which I'm going to go back to. Um, the uh, document, and because I think this is a great time to talk about backup. So there was a question from Sanjay early, early in the talk. Do you have any document for DR and backup solution for ClickHouse? We want to do backup on S3. So uh, if you come talk to, I, for, for me, you know, like working at Altenity, um, I would say use ClickHouse backup. Um, it does exactly that. And the way that it works is you freeze the tables, which means that the all the you know all the references to the files in tables or parts are hard linked in a shadow directory, and then you can just copy them off as safely without ClickHouse changing things under you. 
and stick them in S3. And that's exactly what ClickHouse Backup does. It will capture your schema. It will you know, ensure the tables are properly frozen, get them, make copies of them, move it to S3, and then unfreeze them. Not necessarily in that order, but that's basically what it does. Um, the interesting question is what else is coming inside ClickHouse itself for backup and restore? And um, Alexander or Tatiana or Alexi, um, if do you want to comment on that? Because that's definitely been an interesting topic over time. Uh, currently, one of our senior developers is already working. And actually, yesterday, the first prototype of new ClickHouse backup internal implementation was merged. So we will have backup query, restore query. Uh, it should be. Uh, uh, you can also back up separate tables, so you can back up whole databases. And uh, I don't sure that databases backups will be consistent in some sense, but I think the final point of this is consistent backups of multiple tables or databases. And also in our, and maybe you know that the, our tables, our main table engines like Merge Tree and uh, replicated merge tree also can now work over S3 or F3. So I think our, yes. backups, our backups also will work over F3 from uh, inside ClickHouse with backup and restore queries. But I yeah. don't know a lot of details of new implementation of ClickHouse backups, just a level overview. We're going to, I, I think I need that person's name because I think he or she is going to get dragged into this meetup to tell us, uh, to confess what's going on. Question here, uh, uh, does backup cause downtime? ClickHouse backup does not. Um, so because it's just, it's as I say, it's creating the shadow directory with hard links, which are then wiped out. It doesn't interfere with ClickHouse operation. Do, do you happen to know whether the backup implementation, I, I assume it will it will run of hot. Course, of course, it will not yeah. cause downtime or yeah. lock it or some locking, for example. Right. Yes. Yeah. And so the big the, the big advantage is that, of course, it'll be embedded, which is something we've all been waiting for. I'm uh, looking for other. Um, I don't see a lot of other general uh, ClickHouse questions. Uh, let's see. Um, they feel free to ask them, and in fact, if anybody wants to unmute, I'll I'll go ahead and. Um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just allow everybody to talk. Um, you can feel free to jump in and ask questions because we're, um, we're we're at the end of the formal presentations and and it, you know if you want to talk about what you're doing or ask questions, you can just go ahead and do it through the audio. So uh, let's see. Um, I've got most people. I'm just. So if anybody wants to, um, oops, uh, sorry. If I asked you to unmute, I didn't mean to. I'm just trying to get Zookeeper to work. Anybody want to queue up a question? Feel free. <clears throat> Don't be shy. Hi, um, again. Like I want yes. to ask, like, yeah, go ahead. Uh, like in ClickHouse, like if we want to have like multiple data centers or regions, uh, how the replication works between two clusters? Sure. Uh, um, Tatiana or Alexander, do you want to answer that question? Because I know that both of you have experience with running these, um, running cross DC. Um, Because the simple answer, um, Sanjay, is you can run Zookeeper across da data centers as long as they're not excessively far away. So um, 50 milliseconds is um, is the recommendation for the latency. That puts you pretty far away. That's halfway across the United States. And it's the distance. Um, Alexander, if I'm not mistaken, I think Yandex runs, you run clusters between Moscow and St. Petersburg, correct? Uh, actually, Moscow and Finland. Oh, in Finland. Okay, about the same then. Um, so yeah, so you're you're talking, you know, like a pretty long, pretty long distance um, between them. So so that definitely works, and that's supported with. Uh, you just run Zookeeper across um, across DCs. 
And that's kind of the recommendation from our side as well. If, if don't do anything different, just make sure they're not too excessively far away. Obviously, if you have network, if you have flaky networking, that is going to be a serious problem. Um, distributed systems don't work if, if you have like, you know, uh, inconsistent latency. Uh, but, you know, as long as the latency is good, for example, if you're running an Amazon, that should be, that should be possible. By the way, we just had a couple more questions pop up um, that I think are are interesting. Here's here's one. <laughs> Some piff. Users continue to be hopeful now that Zookeeper is getting fixed. When can we expect ClickHouse to have rebalancing? For example, uh, reducing shards from ten to five, um, and just automatically distributing. You, you, you know, we had a reference to Cassandra. I think everybody has Cassandra in their head if they if they know it. Do you have, Alexander, do you have any um, um, uh, schedule on that that you know of? I think we will have a first prototype of, they called it cloud tables, uh, I think in in the middle of the next year or maybe in the Q3 of the next year, I think. Great. But, and that, yeah. Oh, please go ahead. No, no, no addition. Yeah, that ClickHouse Cloud Tables articles, that came out on the ClickHouse blog um, um, a number, actually two years ago, I think. Um, I'm just looking up for the, yep, I'm going to post that in the chat if people want to see it. In fact, it has a picture, a nice picture of clouds. I'm posting it in the chat to everybody. If you want to see what the idea behind it is, um, the link is up there. We have another um just one second here. I've just lost uh, YouTube. Uh, let me get it back. All right. Um, <clears throat> so we had rebalancing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, this is um, Algoriptimus. Um, so ClickHouse is already fast enough for a great portion of its use cases, yay. Uh, but it lacks some features like backup and restore. So we've just discussed that. Um, it is coming. There are external tools like ClickHouse Backup on the fly. Uh, cluster topology change and rebalancing of data. Any plans for these? I, rebalancing of data we just talked about with cloud tables, but then the on-the-fly cluster topology change. Um, that actually, those were two things uh, together. Um, I don't know if there's anything more you want to say. This question seems to be a superset, or it seems to be a um, have I'm been answered. Sure. I'm not sure, but what is on fly cluster topology change uh, except uh, this would be adding shards yeah. or removing shards. Yeah, I'd be adding nodes and removing nodes. Yes, it will be in cloud tables. Cloud tables yeah. should be able to rebalance right. data and to add new nodes. And yeah, and like I think the other thing that is actually worth talking about is also um, the support for object storage, which is um, it becomes a lot simpler to think about adding nodes if you have actually this shared storage that everybody can, um, that all the nodes can access. And I know you have work on your side um, within Yandex going on. We just put in the, um, uh, one of the things that, I believe this is our side, uh, the, um, the fix to, um, uh, to turn off replication um, on S3. It, I can't remember if that's one we did or did you guys do it? Uh, it was implemented by one of the Yandex Cloud engineers. Actually. Okay. But yes, it's already implemented, right. but uh, this all F3 functionality is yeah. not, um, I don't know how to say, polished. So yeah, it works. Uh, we have some internal installations in Yandex Cloud. Right. We even have some in, uh, external clients uh, which use ClickHouse over S3. But right. um, this feature requires some polishing. Yeah, so it's, it's you know, this stuff is at a point, this is another feature where it's at a point where you can test it out, putting large production systems on it might not be the right thing. Um, but the fact that, uh, you know, one of the things uh, we were all waiting for was that, you know, once you're on S3, because it's internally replicated, you don't need to have, re you know, application replication on top of it. Uh, that's just silly. And um, so that's now fixed. Actually, the feature that I was getting confused with uh, that we did put in was, there, for people who are interested in Zookeeper, there is a feature now to allow Zookeeper recovery. Um, if you lose your Zookeeper, if Zookeeper loses its mind, and this happens to just about everybody sooner or later, 
it used to be really, really painful to recover. Now what you can do is recover from the data stored in one of your nodes. And I guess a question for you, Alexander, is, is that capability going to be supported in, in your implementation? Uh, you meant that you can recover your Zookeeper from the another zookeeper. Zookeeper, another zookeeper node or from data stored? In no, from, uh, from the, if you, let's say you lose your Zookeeper metadata. And obviously this is more common when Zookeeper was fully separated. But what you can do with Mike's fix now is you can recover, you can just point to a server and, and basically recover from meta, recreate Zookeeper metadata from, um, from the data that's available on that server. Uh, okay, but uh, this functionality, maybe I don't fully understand what you're talking about, but uh, this functionality was embedded into ClickHouse for several years. Uh, if you lose, uh, we even have a documentation, uh, we have a link in our documentation what to do if you lost all your Zookeeper data. We have plug called force restore metadata and so on. And it is something different. Well, I think it's different because it previously you, um, yeah, because you can force, like if you lose a node, for example, or I'm if- sorry, uh, yeah, to explain? Yeah, Tatiana, go for it. Yeah, yeah, that it's uh, the new functionality. It just uh, recreates the table by, by scanning the parts that are stored on disk. And it, it, it has nothing to do with uh, what, where the, the metadata is stored, Zookeeper or Housekeeper, it doesn't matter because it's embedded in the, into ClickHouse as a system restore replica uh, statement. But the idea here is that you can, it will properly um, ensure that the Zookeeper metadata is fully yeah. up to date with the state yeah. of the table on the server. And on the disk, yeah. Yeah, on the disk. On the local disk, yeah. yeah. So anyway, I, th that's something oh, we'll- It's the same, be, uh, kind yeah. of the same as a normal insert operation, kind of. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't insert data, it only insert metadata. Right. Yeah. Okay, I probably confused things horribly here. Uh, any further questions? Um, I don't see, um, I'm just looking across the, oh, uh, okay, here we go. Uh, so, uh, it looks like, uh, oh, here's a, here's a comment from uh, James Greenhill. The, between this and vectorized red panda, uh, which is a C++ Kafka drop-in replacement, I'm excited at the idea of retiring our zookeeper uh, cluster requirement. Uh, James, do you mind uh, just coming on and talking a little bit about your experience with red panda? Uh, this is something we've, we've actually, I've actually talked to those guys as, as I think other people here have. Do you have anything to share about what you've learned uh, from using that? Not really too much, but this is like super early stage when we tested it locally, but I'm really excited at the idea of it. Cool. If, if, you, guys, um, if you guys make progress on that, it'd be really neat to have you do a talk on it and, and share what you learned. Absolutely. Good. All right. Um, let's see. We've got another uh, question here. So say, um, oh, I see the, uh, the, this was a follow-up on the, on the question about large versus small nodes that was in the question and answer. I think at this point, I don't see a whole lot more questions coming up unless I've missed stuff off. Um, oh, here's one. Uh, oh, okay. What are the timing and plans for better resource pool management to have more, um, to have more guarantee of resources for certain operations? Um, it seems like the primary control is max threads per query at the moment. Anyone want to comment on uh, resource uh, management? Uh, uh, yes, uh, one of our lead developers <laughs> uh, is working on such task, which is called processors. And actually, it is another implementation of ClickHouse pipeline. And actually, processors works in production for about one year. But uh, this implementation is not complete currently. And uh, it is main requirement for resource pools implementation in ClickHouse. And, uh, Currently, um, one uh, one of uh, person from my team is working on processors, and I think it will be uh, the most part uh, will be finished uh, until 2022. Yes, and uh, after that we will start implementing resource pools. 
Great. And will this work? Will this be effectively like kind of like having C groups or something similar and in, embedded inside ClickHouse? Is that the is that the idea behind it? Mm, as far as I know, yes. Okay. Great. Good. Um, I'm going to go hey, ahead Robert. and yeah. Oh, please go hey. ahead. Sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so I've been looking for actually. I guess it's uh, two questions mainly for uh, Altinity. Um, so I've been setting up, uh, I've been working on setting up, up the, you know, the ClickHouse operator on Kubernetes on AWS. And um, I'm kind of in the dark in um, secret management or um, not necessarily secret management, but passwords for uh, my main um, admin user for uh, ClickHouse. So I really love your videos and I've seen a few options. So one is using the, X, the user's XML file, and one is using SQL-based commands to create users um, and, and the password. But I'm not really sure how can I, let's say, I, I lose the password that I created with the SQL command. Um, so I'm just looking for a, you know, a good um, you know, solution for that, I guess. So do you have any experience with that? Um, yeah, I would, uh, Tatiana, I bet you have some opinions on this. Personally, what I would do is I would just have one admin account defined in XML and there's a flag. Um, it's um, enable, ah, darn it, what is it? Uh, um, uh, uh, like an RBAC <laughs> enabled flag. Uh, anyway, you set it to one and that allows you to that, at, from that point on, that um, uh that account can do SQL-based access control. Then you do everything else in, in uh, using that account. That account, you want to set it up so that it, for example, doesn't have remote access. So you're going to have to get onto the, you, you may have to go onto the host or directly connect to uh, to do these commands if, if you want to prevent them from being uh, getting attacked this way from the outside. But the basic idea is then once you're in, you know, once you have this account enabled, you can use it to do on cluster commands. Um, so you can do create user, create profile, uh, all that kind of stuff um, using SQL, using on cluster commands so that they then get blasted across your whole cluster. And if you lose your password, you can reset it with that root account. Right. But usually people would, you know, use Vault, um, right, to manage it. And then I've seen some examples on, you know, on the internet um, using the from env um, option in the XML files where you can, you know, um, set uh, um, uh, a password in the environment variables, and then you can import mm -hmm. the secret uh, using the from env option, uh, I think. Tatiana, do you ha have you used that before? No, not really. I have not used it. Um, yeah, so I I don't know that trick, but it if you can read them from an environment that environment variable, that definitely would be really interesting. Um, and are you um, so the and what you want to do is you basically want to have something as a Kubernetes secret and then be able to read it using from end. Is that what you're trying? I guess to do? I guess not Kubernetes secret. Yeah. yeah, I want to move from Kubernetes secret uh, right. to something like Vault by HashiCorp. You know. Got it. Yeah. So right now there isn't, I mean, there isn't to my knowledge, any um, easy way to, to, you know, to integrate vault uh, directly with ClickHouse. You're going to end up, you know, having to string things together uh, yourself, uh, but this is yeah. something we've definitely looked at um, with feel free to, um, you know, if you, if you're working with the operator, feel free to post an issue on the GitHub uh, for the ClickHouse operator, and uh, we'll we'll have a look at it. No problem. Do we you have said, enough time yeah. for? Yeah, go stuff? for it. Um, yeah, uh, feel free. Um, but another question, I think, is, I think maybe it's I have you know not enough experience with um, with ClickHouse uh, with the operator. But how how can I make sure? Um, you know, when you set up in the, in the ClickHouse installation manifest, um, sharding and replication. So there's the, configura the configuration um, section and the clusters configuration. 
where you mentioned layout and you know shard, shards count and replica count. So if I will mention the shards count uh, to be three, I will get three po three po pods pods. I'll get three pods. So mm -hmm. and then when I you know so I think I don't really understand um, you know why you get three pods. Um, why like pods are based on shards? That's the high availability high availability part. Well, what's going on here? You know, Click Clickhouse is, is has this sharding and replication model where you're basically you basically have a set of Clickhouse servers, right? And so what you're doing is is saying that hey, I want to have like um. I'm planning to, you know, subset my data and maybe have half of the data in one shard and half the data in, in another. So already you're going to have to have two servers for that to be able to implement that. And then if you have replicas for each of them, that will multiply by the number of replicas you have. So two times three, for example. When you say servers, you say these are you server process. These are server cards. processes. Yes. No, actually, Clickhouse processes. That's what you're creating. That's why when you put a replica, when you put your replica count to two and your shard count to two, you'll get four pods started because it's going Got to it. create, it's going to create two sets of two server processes. A pod is just a process. So, right. um, so that's, that's what's going on there. So you can pretty much tell, you know, like if you set that count, you'll, you'll know that ClickHouse, the, the operator is doing it right because you'll see you'll see the number of pods, which is exactly the multiple of your shards times your replicas. Got it, thanks. Cool, any any other questions? We're coming up on the top of the hour, but happy to happy to answer more. Um, access management equal one, thank you so much, Alon. <laughs> I was just looking it up in my slides. I don't, obviously I spend too much time on accounting. Hello, am I audible? Yes, you are, go for okay. it. Okay. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you to everyone. Uh, it's an amazing project and community what you have created. So congratulations again. Um, I have a question. Uh, I read that the buffer engine is not recommended and uh, it happened to have solved some problems to me because of course it, it, uh, it has a less complexity uh, once you can get rid of a, an aggregator that because it solves to us the problem of having a very frequent small writes, the buffer engine. So I wanted to know if it's, is it still the case that it is not recommended or um, according to the documentation it's not? Uh, may, I answer, may I try to answer? Uh, in ClickHouse, um, now it is not recommended because we have several better solutions. Uh, first of all, we have uh, compact parts in ClickHouse, and if you're using quite fresh ClickHouse version, I think started from 20.8, uh, compact parts enabled by default, and you can have mm, much more frequent inserts than you had before. Uh, which version do you use? Uh, the moment is the latest certified by Altini, but, but to be honest, we have several clusters and we haven't upgraded everyone, all of them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what was it, 21? Help 21. me out, guys. Yes, 21.3, probably. Yes, yes, 21.3. Yeah. Yes, oh, that's okay. correct. If this, perform if this right performance is not okay for you, uh, we already. We already implemented feature. We have a pull request which is called asynchronous inserts, and um, this is more reliable semantics in ClickHouse. Uh, it is in some kind similar to buffer tables, but it is not a separate table. It is just uh, some in-memory queue. Um, yeah, this feature is not merged now, but uh, it will be merged, I think, in the next ClickHouse release, and uh, this will allow you to have. Uh, I think two orders of two orders of magnitude more inserts per second. That is amazing. Great, thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, and there's. I was just trying to search. We had a blog article where we uh, or a webinar, but there's. The, if you look in the ClickHouse docs, it definitely, you know, sort of the traditional wide parts, compact parts, and in-memory parts. I think solve a lot of these issues. We use compact parts a lot um, because they often. 
they have fewer files. So if you're on a file system where that, that's slow, for example, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's better not to have to open up a bunch of files. Because I have also benchmarked the the HTTP server itself, and it mm -hmm. had a, a great throughput actually. So it was actually the um, the the data being written, not actually the connections being created to the HTTP. Uh, so uh, that's why we wanted to know more about it because buffer was great. So, but I, I haven't tried the compact path. So obviously, I'm going to try it. Thank you. Great, great questions. Good. Any further questions? Take a, take one or two more. Hate to... All right. Well, we're at two o'clock. Alexander, thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful. I can't believe we never had you on before. And Tatiana, thank you so much. Alexi, uh, thank you for joining. And uh, yeah, it's been great to have all of you. The next meetup is going to be in it almost in exactly two months. I've already got one uh, talk lined up. Um, the uh, we'll be publishing that shortly as soon as I get the definition, uh, um, uh, the title and the definition. But so you watch your calendars. Also watch out for this uh, announcement on this uh, uh, conference that I mentioned. That's coming up on November uh, 2nd and we'll be covering open source analytic projects. Of course, ClickHouse will be a star. So thanks everybody. Have a great day and we'll see you at the next meetup. Thank you for the invitation. You're most welcome. <laughs>